Welcome back to another episode of Cobra Kai Companion. I am Peter. I am Brianna. And, and I'm Peter Nude, aka a Nude. <laughs> so excited to be here. Wait, was I not supposed to come in there? <laughs> Uh, okay, so little inside baseball here. Uh, we are redoing this first part, and it's funny because you did that exact same thing last time. So I'm gonna keep doing the same exact <laughs> bit because we recorded, and apparently half of the podcast episode got deleted. Yes, so yeah. I'm really going to recreate every. Now you get to see how good of an actor I am, guys, because I'm just pretending that all these things are coming to me for the first time. Right. All right. We'll we'll see how that goes. We'll You're see an how old that goes. pro with this now. Um, yeah. And apparently, we are not. Peter needs to stop touching things because things keep moving, and we're just sorry. Gonna sorry. Blame it all on him. All right. Um, so Dan, this is you know the first time of um, first time ish that we've had you on on the pod. So let's get to know a little bit about you before we discuss you know Cobra Kai stuff in the future where my hair is a lot longer too. Um, Coming from New York, you know, you come from a family of immigrants. Uh, you went to college for pre-med at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Yeah. Was acting and stand-up, was that ever, you know, like uh, ever in your future? Um, it was It was always on the sidelines. You know, when I was in high school, uh, I joined an my Thanks to my progressive high school, they had an improv troupe, which back then a lot of, a lot of schools didn't have that. So I kind of got into improv. And I got into getting laughs on stage and I really loved it. Um, and then I went to college, I went to Johns Hopkins, I was pre-med, uh, I graduated with honors, did well on my MCATs, got into medical school and then uh, decided to give my parents a heart attack and become a comedian. But um, when I was in college, I was also doing uh, improv and I started to do stand-up in Baltimore uh, as well. And I just fell in love. So uh, instead of going to med school, I decided to take a year off and move to New York and, and do stand up. And that was probably it's, now it's been about 20 years off. This was one of the things that, that um, amazes me because when we talked to um, OK, Emmy Aquari, he said that he went to college for neuroscience. You were pre-med. So it just appears that with the exception of those who have been actors their whole lives, this entire cast is really stinking smart. Matt Lewis is a professor. Um, it's just like Josh Hill is going to do journalism. Yeah, well, I'm I I have a degree in journalism. I love Josh, but you don't have to be super smart to get one of those. <laughs> yeah, but he was Whoa. at UPenn. They were all at UP UPenn. Right. Yeah. They were, they were Ivy League, but yeah. Well, that's part. I got like one of the prerequisites to get onto Cobra Kai is to show your SAT score, and if it's not above a certain level, you're not allowed in. Which is why I don't understand how Brett Ernst was allowed in the, in the cast. <laughs> We all know Brett. So it's not just the looks. We just know he screams community college. You guys know what I'm saying? So I do. <laughs> As someone exactly who that. attended one of those, I resemble that <laughs> remark. But I don't disagree uh, with you. So. <laughs> wait, you said you resemble that remark. I think you meant I resent that remark, which as a community college graduate, you didn't have the right word. No, no, no. I absolutely <laughs> resemble that remark. That's why I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I'm joking. I, I um, went beyond, now, though. I went beyond, you know. You nice. mentioned you gave your, your parents a heart attack, so it sounds like they weren't, um, you know, supportive at first, or were they? Uh, yeah, no, they were super-duper supportive. You know, they, they escaped Iran, uh, left all their money there, came to America to start from scratch, made money, finally, enough to send me to college, and then I decided to throw that college degree into the toilet and become an open mic stand-up comedian uh, handing out flyers uh, on the streets of New York City at 1.30 in the morning to do five minutes of stage time. They were thrilled with that. <laughs> no, they were fucking livid. They hated it. <laughs> they were completely livid and rightfully so. I get it, man. I mean, fuck. They literally like escaped in a donkey's asshole to come to America. <laughs> And then it was like I was taking their dream and shoving it right back into that donkey's asshole. <laughs> uh, this I is have, all new material to me. Yeah, I, um, have, I have no idea how you ever made it as a stand-up comic. You are not the least bit funny. I mean, hey, Yeah, on. not at all. I'm just laughing at donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, the stand-up thing, I, I remember the first time we spoke, you mentioned you must have done – a hundred some odd shows like every year or, or something like that? Yeah, so I had done stand-up um, in New York for 
about seven years. And then I got into, uh, I got into, no, actually it's not true. I was doing stand-up for like three years. So I wasn't really that, which is not a lot of time in stand-up years. And I got lucky enough to get on to Last Comic Standing. Um, and it was season two of that show. It was like a hot show. And then um, from that, I started to tour colleges. So I became, uh, in short order, I became like the highest booked college comedian in the country for three years in a row. I was doing 165, 170 shows a year, traveling like crazy. I, I've done stand up in 49 states. Damn you, Hawaii. One day you'll book me. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I had, I, it was a cool, it was a cool life because I was traveling a lot, but it was also a tough life because I wasn't able to stay in New York or LA and do TV stuff. Um, so it was kind of a, it stunted my career in that way. It helped my standup get better, but it stunted any acting and stuff like that. My son's college, uh, where he went, they used to have stand-up comics that would come and perform um, in the Hawk's Nest every Friday. And I'm kind of wondering what now if... Did he go to? Huh? What college did he go to? Quincy University in Illinois. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we went. Over, I did perform there. I did perform there. I performed at all the random little schools that when, like, March Madness is happening and you're like, what? Where is that school? Where is Our Lady of Amanda? Where is that school? <laughs> And it's like, no, I've performed at Our Lady of Amanda. I performed in the cafeteria there. I high five the statue of Amanda on the way in. I, uh, I, you know, I've, I've performed at all these random little holes in the walls. And it's always, you know, it was fun to go around the country. But again, it stunted my career a little bit, uh, which is kind of a bummer. But then it ended up, it ended up, uh, you know, transitioning, thankfully. So, you, uh, um, not too long. Oh, go, you, go you Peter, you go. Oh, okay. Uh, recently, you um, uh, wrote a film, uh, but you you've written way before you even got into acting. Uh, one of which you uh, wrote for like the roast of Gene Simmons. Um, what was that experience like uh, writing early on in your career? Yeah, um, my first job that I got uh, writing was um, actually it was it was an MTV sketch comedy show called Short Circuits with Nick Cannon. Um, and so I moved to LA for that. And then after that, I, I wrote for the roast of Gene Simmons and I met Jeff Ross and he was like the nicest guy in the world. And it was like, so it was, it was weird. Cause it was the first time I was being collaborative, let's call it, you know? And the first experience was really strange. The Nick Cannon one, like it was, it wasn't the most pleasant work environment. And then this next one was really pleasant. And, you know, I'm still friends with Jeff Ross and to his credit, he is, the nicest guy in the world. He creates such a great work environment. And, um, you know, it made me really, it made me love the collaboration of working on a, on, on a team, on a set uh, and stuff like that. Cause as a standup, you're so used to just working by yourself. And so it's hard for you to, to kind of share that love with other people. Uh, Jeff Ross, his, his roasts, I mean, Comedy Central, brilliant. He's like, uh, who was it that did the roasts? in the in the um 80s that like got really really big for him but he's kind of taken over for them um and then he did a whole series um called historical roasts um yeah. and i mean so much brilliant the funny thing about jeff ross is that he is, has made a career off of being mean and offensive to people and i've literally never met anyone nicer uh in this in this career so he's such a funny little mix like that for me uh, one of the things that the stand-up has gotten a rather bad rap the last 12 months, you were talking about, you know, one of your work environments not being uh, that pleasant. And there's been a lot of talk about the toxicity backstage for mm -hmm. um, comics of color, for women, stand-up comics, things like that. Have you run into any of that that you would characterize as actual toxicity or racism or colorism toward yourself? Um, n no, I haven't. And I know that it's, it would sound a lot sexier to be like, yes, and I prevailed <laughs> through it. I just think, I think in general, I think in general, comedy clubs are a toxic environment for everyone. And I think that it's a little, it's easy to kind of look at that and be like, oh, well, it's because I was this or because I was that. The only time I would say, I experienced toxicity in comedy was, you know, I started doing stand-up shortly after 9-11 and 
it was a tough time to be Middle Eastern on stage, uh, especially in New York City where I was performing. Um, and I never had any clubs really tell me what I could or couldn't say, but you definitely felt from the audience that for your safety, you probably wanted to hide the fact that you were Middle Eastern for a while. So that was a pretty shitty feeling, but um, in a weird way, also a good thing for, my, for me career-wise though, because uh, I feel like before 9-11, I was using my Middle Easternness as a crutch. Like I was doing a lot of terrorism jokes and stuff like that on stage. And then after that, it was like, okay, let's hide this part of me. Um, and while yes, it was, it was tough for my pride or, and stuff like that, it actually ended up being good for my comedy because it forced me to find the funny in things that weren't just easy crutches. Um, so yeah, I think in general, comedy clubs are a toxic environment because you have so many narcissists and people who just, you know, there's no teamwork in, in a comedy club. Like it's literally like, you know, there's good vibes here and there and we all love each other and we're all in a fraternity together. But at the end of the day, you want to do better than everyone else. <laughs> and, you know, or at least you want to do really well. And, um, and you know, it's, it's very hard to keep your ego in check a lot of the times when it's like you're getting instant feedback from the crowd of, did you do as well as the last guy? Did the last guy do better, better than you? You get nervous when the guy right before you crushes and then you have to go on after. And, you know, I would say that for me, that's been independent of sex, color, anything like that. You know, like if, if Jessica Kirsten is going on before me, I'm quaking in my shoes as much as I would with any, you know, any white dude because she's going to destroy and she's not destroying because she's a lesbian woman. She's destroying because she's a hilarious comedian. So I don't know. I feel like that stuff, it's, it's a little harder for me to wrap my head around that culture in the comedy clubs, but you know, I'm, I'm that, that's just, that's just my experience. One of your uh, earlier works was uh, kicking it. Um, you know, I have to credit your Instagram live for a few things. Uh, it, it put us in touch together. You, you uh, approved my request to join you on a live, but one of the lives I joined in on, there was a lot of kids talking about your character falafel Phil and goats and stuff. So not a show that I watched, so I'm not very familiar with the character, but uh, can you share your experience on Kicking It? Yeah, so Kicking It was my first acting job in LA. And uh, it was kind of interesting because it was off the heels of, I did the Montreal Comedy Festival. I did really well on it. I booked The Tonight Show off of it. I met Jay Leno, all that stuff. I moved to LA and I met with the heads of every network in town, ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC. And they make you feel like you're gonna be the next Seinfeld. They're like, we're just gonna find the right show for you. And you're like, this is amazing. And I get a call from my manager and he's like, guess what, Dan, I got you an audition. I'm like, awesome. Is it gonna be for, you know, like, <laughs> like, is it gonna be for the next friends? What's it gonna be? And he's like, no, it's a Disney show. And I'm like, oh no, I don't wanna do a Disney show. He's like, no, you gotta do it just to meet the casting director. Her name is Julie Ashton. I'm like, all right, fine, send me the audition. And I see the audition. And it's for a character on a Disney show called Kicking It. And the character's name is Falafel Phil. And you know, you gotta know that like, I never, like I said, I didn't really do much Middle Eastern comedy. And you know, I, I didn't do like these Middle Eastern themed shows like the camels of comedy. Like I never did those things, but I get this audition and it's like, and it's pretty, pretty far out there, kind of racist where, this character, Falafel Phil, this is the audition. Falafel Phil runs a restaurant in the mall. And the kids who are the main characters of this show come into the mall uh, to have lunch and they're discussing how they want to start a boy band. And I run in as Falafel Phil, who the proprietor of said Falafel restaurant. And I'm like, oh, you're thinking of starting a boy band? In my hometown of Hachmachistan, I had the boy band. We were called the Hachmach Boys. Who could forget our hit song, Baby's Got the Noosh? Yalla Habibi, baby's got the noosh. Yalla Habibi, baby got the noosh. And that was the audition. And I'm like, this is crazy, but I'm going to do it just to meet the casting director. So I go to meet the casting director. I do my audition. I get back in the car and my manager calls me. He's like, great news, you got the role. And I'm like, I don't want this role. <laughs> no, you gotta do it because then it's not gonna be fair to the casting director. 
So I'm like, okay. So I go and I do, he's like, don't worry, it's just one episode. I go, I do the episode, I kill it. And they start booking me for multiple episodes. Long story short, five years later, Falafel Phil becomes the breakout star of this show. I get like mauled by kids whenever I walk down the street. And as you see, in a non, non-sexual way, please FBI, don't come after me. <laughs> and then, uh, as you saw, Peter, when I do my Instagram lives, like kids just lose their shit when they, <laughs> when they, when they jump on. And, you know, as much as I had problems playing this role because of the kind of racial aspects of it, I, I try to focus on the positive, you know, aspects. And there's really nothing like the joy that you can put on a kid's face, you know, like when they meet you or like, you know, we would do events in cancer hospitals and stuff like that. And these kids like really, it like makes their day to see you. And so, you know, um, and another plus from that is that I learned how to act uh, with cameras. You know, I had never done that before. So for four years, I got like the best acting boot camp I could have gotten. So that puts you right up there with Peyton and Jacob as the Disney kids on the Cobra Kai cast, right? So you have well, just I as many fans myself, as they do. I consider myself a Disney elder, not quite the Disney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, by the way, if you're like 18, that makes you a Disney elder. So. <laughs> The over 18 all valley disney elder yeah yeah exactly but it's funny because a lot of the fans now from kicking it which was a karate based show are now fans of cobra kai which is another karate based show that i'm in and like you know it's this fun like worlds colliding thing and everyone's like oh my god falafel fills in cobra kai does he only do karate themed shows so it's been a it's been very fun to like you know blow little kids minds with uh, the uh the little uh transition from one into the other somebody tweeted at the official account the other day and they were like you need to get somebody from kicking it on cobra kai and her wit swoops in and he goes already did and i just <laughs> yeah. i thought it was amazing and he posted a picture of Fiat's falafel phil that was so funny yeah because everyone's kind of pulling for the kids on the show who were like you know they're like real martial artists to be on the show little did they know right it's like one of those things when you ask the genie for something, you have to be careful what you ask for because it might be, you might get your, you know, if you say like, I want to cure world hunger, like the genie might do that by just killing everyone who's alive because they won't be hungry anymore. Oh so, yeah. He does give the rules. He's like, you tell me to make you a prince. I could just boom. There's that guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's almost like uh, one of those things. You should be up there on one of those uh, Buzzfeed articles where it's like, Oh, something you didn't know. About Dan to do, you know, almost like Fisher Stevens also played an Indian man in Short Circuit <laughs> back in the 80s. Like, wait, okay. what? <laughs> Who yeah, doesn't exactly. know that Fisher Stevens played an Indian man in Short Circuit in the 80s, though? I did not a know. A couple that. decades. Took me a couple decades. That. I didn't. Yeah. I, I, most of us didn't know that Fisher Stevens wasn't Indian. But um, yeah, if you lived through the 80s, you knew he was in that movie. You learned something. I forgot where it was. I forget where I shared this, but I, I had mentioned that um, I thought there was two Fisher Stevens, one white, one Indian. Mm -hmm. That was talking to me because I was talking about Bakersfield. Right. Well, because um, yeah, Amy brought it up. She's like, that's like a, a new favorite thing about me, you know, <laughs> uh, having that. Um, yeah, Brianna, did you have any other questions before we get into Cobra Kai talk? Um, the only thing is I would have to ask you your preference between stand-up acting and writing. Which of the three is your favorite? Ooh. That's a very tough question because they each offer very different gratification. Um, so let me just go into the pluses and minus of each and then, and then, uh, and you'll see why I have a tough time with this question. So the thing that I love about acting is that I don't have to do the writing. I just show up and read someone else's lines. And again, I have the honor of reading lines that are written by, you know, Josh, John and Hayden. So it's, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're fantastic lines. Cause sometimes you do shows and stuff and you're like, Oh God, I have to change these up or something. Cause this is not going to be good. But, um, you know, douche clown, it's a great line. It is. So it's a really good I, word. Um, yeah. So I have to, so that's kind of fun. And also I love playing a character. Like it's just kind of fun to, it's like fun to do. Like you get that same fun, like kid fun. Like, like this is a fun thing. I'm playing games. I'm playing make believe basically. It's a lot of fun. And also you get to meet like your heroes. You know, I got my ass kicked by Johnny Lawrence. Like there's no greater honor in my career. 
Um, so that's fun. And then also, you know, that gets a lot of, a lot of people see you and it's exciting when they see you in person. It's funny because I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the second part of our podcast, but I'll just say it now, but it's like, it's very weird to finally be on a show that is like watched by more people in the world than any other show and then have to go outside and put a mask on so no one can recognize you. And uh, I was hiking and there was this mom with these two kids hiking and the boy who was probably like 11 years old was wearing a Cobra Kai face mask. And I stopped and I was like, do you, do you like Cobra Kai? He's like, yeah, I love Cobra Kai. And I was like, I'm a noosh. And I pulled my mask down and he like lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's very fun. That's a very fun thing of the acting. Like people really fall in love with you and that's kind of cool. But then the stand up is like, or let me do writing next. The cool thing about writing, writing is like, it's so hard. It's probably the hardest of the three because you're just kind of trapping yourself in your house and you're just writing what you think is good and you send it off for notes. And it's like a real grueling process. And um, actually Josh Shield said something that, that rings very true with me, which is I hate writing, but I love being done with writing. And being done with writing is so gratifying because you have this thing, this tactile, tangible thing that you can send off to people and they can read it and you can kind of just sit back and relax and let it do the talking. So that's really, really cool too. And then there's stand up, which is kind of a mix of all of them. You know, you're writing your own stuff, you're performing your own stuff, and you get instant gratification from the crowds, which you don't get instant gratification from the other two. You know, the other two, it takes time. You got a release date, you got to wait a couple months, you know, you don't know how it's going to come out. This is so instant. It's like instant, instant, instant gratification. And um, I love that about it. But the, the, the downside of stand up is like, I still get really nervous the day of a show. Like if I'm doing a stand-up show at night, that whole day, I'm just feeling like shit. <laughs> so I hate that feeling. But then once I hit the stage and I get my first laugh, it's literally the best feeling that I have in life. Like better than sex. So like, I don't know if there's kids listening to this. Uh, so Probably, but that's okay. Uh, uh, better, than, better, than, better than, than, than sugary cereal. Um, so yeah, you know, they each have their pluses and minuses and I'm just happy and fortunate enough to be able to, to weigh those pluses and minuses of all three of those things. Okay. One thing I do know that was not in the second half. So we absolutely need to get to it is green eggs and Dan. We yes. cannot go without talking about that. So yes. Green eggs and Dan. I'm so glad you asked about it again. Green eggs and Dan. <laughs> is my food podcast. Um, and I came up with this idea because I loved looking into my friend's fridges when I went to their houses. And I feel like you can learn so much more about someone from looking into their fridge than anything else. So um, I kind of hit up a bunch of my, my celebrity friends and saw if they were into this and they all wanted to do it. And I went and tried to pitch this idea of a podcast where we it's an interview show based on the inside of someone's fridge and no one wanted to make it. So I decided to make it myself and it ended up becoming the number one food podcast in the country. Um, and it's really, really fun because it's like a fun, funny, non-pretentious food podcast. It's just like, we just try to get laughs and have fun. And there's two Cobra Kai guests um, that have been on the show. Uh, we've had Josh Heald, who's one of my favorite people to eat with. Um, and also we've had Brett Ernst, who's one of my least favorite people in life. And... <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I love I love cousin Louie. And he and I actually, whenever we're shooting Cobra Kai, we go out for dinner every night. So we had a lot to talk about what it was like to eat during Cobra Kai. Um, and actually, Courtney Hengeler, Hengeler is going to be a guest uh, on the next season. So a lot of a lot of Cobra Kai love uh, on Green Eggs and Dan. But if you just want the voyeuristic aspect of it, just go on my Instagram at Stand Up Dan. And you can look inside all these famous people's fridges and you'll realize that they're just like us. Just kidding. They're not anything like us. They're weird. They all have weird nut milks, a lot of strange nut milk in their fucking fridges. And they love saying that they have nut milk. Like, oh, this is my nut milk. And they say it like as if it's not funny to say nut milk. They're like, oh, this is just all my nut milks. I have nut milks over here. They have milks made out of shit that I didn't think makes milk. Like fig milk? <laughs> Where are you squeezing the milk out of the fig, John Legend? So 
Uh, I, I've never funny. figured out how they milk an almond. I just know it tastes really good. Where are those almond titties that they're getting <laughs> the almond milk from? <laughs> Almond titties. Oh, we, you, you heard it here. Right? I'm excited for Courtney's episode because you and she together out of character just as yourselves. Uh, oh, my God. When, when you love- guys get going on Twitter and Instagram, I just love everything about it. You're both so fucking funny. We throw a lot of shade uh, to each other. We throw a lot of sass. Uh, but it's obviously all love. But she's a she's a very, very, very fun person to fuck with. And by the way, I said fuck with, not fuck, because I know that all you fan fiction people have been planting some <laughs> seeds. She's a married woman. And Anush would That's never right. do that to his boss. Or would he? Right. You know what, Mor- though? That didn't stop Marty Cove from claiming to be her daughter's father on Twitter. So, you know, there was the whole, uh, uh, no, when, when she finally announced she was pregnant with her yeah. daughter, like a month before she was born. Um, uh, Marty said something about, and you'll never guess who the father, the father is. And then her wits comes in and goes, damn it, Marty. We said no spoilers. Oh my it, God. That's it, it, yeah. It was, it, it's hilarious. Yeah. There's a, a lot think... of fun, uh, Cobra Kai incest going on. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's the new game of Thrones. And I think that'd be a good segue into the, uh, the Cobra Kai talk. Yes. Welcome to, we're, we're now going to magically transport into time travel with Dana Doot. And we are going to go back a week and a half into the past. There we go. So uh, uh, before before we move on to Cobra Kai, just real quick, uh, Dan, because I, I, when I get a chance to, I love tuning into your lives uh, because I love the troll, especially when your brother's with you. Like yeah. I love the, the trolling you guys do with the kids that, that you bring on. Like <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. I remember there was like one girl, she must have been like 12 years old. And um I think her mom was watching Cobra Kai and like her mom jumped on real quick and she's like, I kind of remember Fall Off Fulfill. And then you're like, I'm, I'm also from Cobra Kai. And she like had a brain fart and couldn't like place you quite in the show. That one I remember. And then another kid who mentioned something about a goat and you and your brother like, oh yeah, he um, he died. Monday, that's Monday. He died I, last I had a goat in the show. The, uh, Fall Off Fulfill had a goat in the show. But yeah, I've been doing these Instagram lives and it's been very funny to see the kids who are still fans of mine. And I just kind of talk to them like they're adults. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. But yeah, um, I'm doing a, but I also have like a cooking series on my Instagram called Cooking Time, which is all in my highlights, which is just me putzing around cooking stuff, uh, which is also very fun to see um, if you guys want some more content. Yeah. But yeah, it's been, uh, uh, I'm sorry, go on. I was just going to say, I I need to watch that because I don't cook and I hate cooking and I enjoy watching other people cook. So I should probably start tuning into that. It's very fun. Yeah. Uh, So with with Cobra Kai, uh, is it uh, one of those scenarios where like your agent reached out and said, hey, there's this or did you land the role of Anush in any other way? Yeah. So I've actually known the guys for a long time now. Um, And... I've met, it's funny, we met through weird ways. Like uh, John's John's uh, sister is married to my best friend. Mm. And John also went to college with one of my good friends. And Josh and I became friends through John. And, you know, we were single together in LA. So we'd go out. It's funny, we went out once. And I was like, great, I finally have an awesome wingman. And then, like, he met his wife the next day. Uh- so, <laughs> but... I've always been, we've always been friends and, you know, we'd help each other out. They, they'd help me out more than I would help them out. But, you know, with writing and stuff, but, you know, they're always like, we're, we're going to keep you in mind. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll have a project or something. Josh and I also tried to sell a TV show together. Like, so we always kind of worked in the same circles and stuff. And they straight up called me and they were like, yo, we're doing a, we're doing a show called Cobra Kai. It's going to be like a re uh, boot of the Karate Kid saga. And we have a role for this character that we think you'd be perfect for. And I was like, done. I don't care how much you're even paying me. I'm in. Because like, I've yeah. always wanted to work with the guys because I love them so much. And, you know, to be a part of Karate Kid history is like, is like a dream come true. So they basically wrote Anoush, uh, they wrote Anoush for me. That's, that's amazing. I mean, and, and then you shared the story about Josh meeting his wife. And it's kind of funny because the, the night that you accepted my request to go live with you, 
you, you read her. I didn't know she was on Instagram. You're like, oh, that's Josh's wife, Debbie. And I'm like, oh, yeah, she's in our group. And then she told you that, like, yeah, I just had a baby. So, yeah. yeah so that yeah, was okay. right. No, Debbie's Debbie's amazing. And weirdly enough, Debbie is like is a distant or she's one of my relatives married one of her relatives. She's also Iranian. So and Deb's last name, her maiden name is Naruzi, which if you see, if that's you Anusha's look, last name. Oh, okay. last name exactly. So it's um, it's a so she's an Iranian Jew and I'm an Iranian Jew and it's an Iranian Jewish last name, which is so funny because someone on Twitter was giving me shit saying like like Netflix, how dare you not hire a South Asian actor to play a South Asian you know character. And I went after, I was like, um, actually Anoush is a Persian name. There's a short for Anoush Ravani, which was one of the uh, Persian kings. And also his last name is Naruzi, which is a Persian Jewish last name. Uh, Persian Jews make up 0.0001% of the world's population. I am a Persian Jew. Are we good to go now? Are we clear? I remember <laughs> seeing that, yeah. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. I was, I was, I loved it. Um, cause Vanity. No, no, no. no, she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. Was- Vanity Fair did the, the same kind of thing last year. They went off on this rant about there being no Asians on the show. And it's like, um, did you miss a noosh? Or, yeah. you know, what? Well, apparently it, it, Iran isn't part of Asia. I don't know. I, I, I guess not. Um, <laughs> apparently not according to Vanity Fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, gosh, I don't even know what to I mean, my, my next question was going to be, did you have to lobby for them to give Anusha last name in season two? But if that's Josh's wife's name, then no, you didn't. They add that in. That was that was like, and it's my cousin's last name because, you know, again, one of my cousins married married her first cousin, Deb's first cousin. And so I have first cousins whose last name is Naruzi, and they love I got took pictures of the plaque and just sent it to them. They loved it. This is just, it's like this, there's this great big universe and this great big world and this huge population of people all trying to make it in the entertainment business. And you guys all ended up in this little bubble with each other, with Billy and Ralph through Billy and Brett knew Ralph. And you all before years before Cobra Kai, you guys were all in like this little bubble together. And honestly, the best advice I can ever give anyone who ever wants to get into this career is be cool with everyone you meet because you never know when it's going to come around, you know? And I think like, just be genuine and be friendly with everyone. Like I really love the guys like Josh Hayden and, and John. And like, we've just known each other forever and we've always been cool with each other and you never know what's going to happen or what's going to, and, and it's like, don't even just be friendly for the possibility of getting a role one day, but it's like, if you're cool and they need to fill up a character who, you know, is who, who matches your type, then they're going to call you before they like send out an audition out and stuff like that. So it's all just like relationships are so important in this business and also talent. I mean, you can't just get the role. and then. Be- <laughs> <laughs> You've always yeah, been really that- nice here. Have the lead in my new show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That guy's really stiff. I don't know how he got the role. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with you being um, a stand-up comedian, let's, let's kind of start with like, you know, season one of Cobra Kai and uh, how much wiggle room did well, were you given, if any, to do some, uh, you know, some improv or was like Anoush, was that all like on paper? You know, they, they definitely give us freedom to, to joke around and to improv here and there. Uh, it's written so tightly, though, that, that we usually just go with what's written, you know. Um, again, the guys are so, they're, they're comedy guys and they know how to write like comedy guys are usually very good at knowing timing, like even with dramatic lines. So everything is, is really well, well kind of just like constructed in terms of the lines and stuff. So there isn't really much you need to do, but there's definitely been some fun stuff, you know, like actually I think uh, in season three, um, jumping into Louis arms was something that we just decided to do. Uh, On the spot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they definitely give us the freedom to play, which is fun because it's like our favorite thing to do. Or like, you know, if you if you watch the scene between me and Louie in season three, where right before I give him the info about Doyona, where we're just like shooting the shit. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of that is just like, it's so conversational and it's literally like just me and Brett having a conversation, you know? 
So uh, we just throw in a lot of like our little isms in it, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, so it's it's cool. They definitely give us the freedom to play around. And then you had that little. Um... What was it you? What was it you told him that was the most Goomba thing he'd ever said? <laughs> yeah. And then he gets in the whole language reclamation. They, that's our word. You can't say that word. Um, I, the the Anoush and Louis relationship. Now I know that Brett has claimed that you know Louis is, or, or Anoush is definitely Louis's sidekick. I've seen you argue back that Louis is Anoush's. So which way does it actually percent. go? First of all, let me tell you something. All right, Louis is nothing without me he's zero <laughs> without me not only that not only that i saved larusso auto in season three okay so this whole show is nothing without a dude okay there's no there's no crease there's no danny there's no johnny if a noose didn't save the whole dealership this is very true. And you're out there taking hits for it, too. You're getting punched in the ribs. I'm getting punched in the ribs. Stepping in dog way, poop. Oh, that, that, that's a funny story, the punch in the ribs, which was, like, my dream come true to get my ass kicked by Johnny from fucking Cobra Kai. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I get to work that day uh, when we're going to shoot that scene, and there's another guy there who, who is wearing the same exact suit as me, and is like a buffer, sort of better looking version of me. I'm like, who is this? And they're like, oh, this is your stuntman. And I'm like, stuntman? <laughs> and I'm like, what's there a stuntman here for? They're like, yeah, for the move, when he throws you, throws you on the car, we're gonna like sub in a stuntman. And I was like, guys, come on. This is the once in a lifetime chance. I'm getting my ass kicked by Johnny. I wanna get my ass kicked by Johnny. And they were like, well, do you have any experience doing stunts or martial arts? And I was like, oh, I'm actually a blue belt in jujitsu. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Why not? Let's do it. So I'm so excited. Meanwhile, um, Billy's literally chucking me up against this car and twisting my arm behind my back so hard that like, and we're doing it like 15 times. And like by the fifth time, I was like, oh my God, I totally should have used this stunt. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me. But I also want to be like manly and not tell Billy like, um, do you mind like not twisting my arm off? <laughs> so I just kind of like, let like he basically like, ripped my arm off by the end of it. I was like, that was that was really fun. It's really an honor working for you. As I like rub my, you know, go take two a leave and stuff. It, Jeff um, Kaplan was the same way because I guess Billy punched him right in the nose um, <laughs> when they were filming one of the scenes this this season, and and Ralph kicked him last year. But he was like, I'm getting my ass kicked by Johnny Lawrence and Daniel Larusso. It's worth it. Yeah, so. Billy's got to stop taking this show so seriously. <laughs> <laughs> He's beating the fuck out of the whole cast. That's the only reason I wanted to come on this podcast, was this is a cry for help. Help! If anyone from SAG-AFTRA is watching, we are getting abused! By Billy Zabka. Billy <laughs> Zabka is abusing us! I've never podcast before. <laughs> oh, oh you made me squirt on the air. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, I, the, he, I, this is all in jest, because he, he and Ralph are two of the nicest guys in the world that I've ever worked with. And I've learned so much from working with them, especially, you know, I do a lot of scenes with Ralph. Ralph is the most humble, most famous person that I've ever worked with in that the ratio of his fame to humility is insane. Like he'll be, he'll do things, he'll go through things. Like we once were, were working on a scene and like they messed up the time that his scene was gonna start. So he just needed to sit on the sidelines for like another hour and he was in full wardrobe and full makeup. And it's it's super annoying to do that. And actors who have 1% of his fame would have bitched about it. And he just sat there and didn't, and just like crack jokes and just like was just so pleasant and nice. And the guy is like, the, he's such a lesson in humility. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to be working with him and to like become friends with him. Like Ralph and I, Ralph is a huge fan of my cooking videos and stuff and his daughter as well. So. We always will have like a fun little chat after I post my videos. Oh, that is nice. so awesome. Yeah. So you've talked about working with Billy, with Ralph, uh, with Brett. Uh, you also work with Courtney. Uh, what do you think about these, uh, some of these fans who actually ship Anoush and Amanda? Wait, what? Yes. <laughs> Wait. Uh, oh, yeah. You yeah. Yeah. Wait, um, what do they do? What do they do? Um, they, they ship you guys. It, it, fan fiction writers, um, uh, a, a couple in particular, they're very, very good friends of mine. 
um, are very invested in um, Amanda and Anoush being in a relationship with each other. Get out of here. Because of season two, yeah. Wait, why because of season two? Because you guys were, because Amanda and Anoush were together that whole summer and Daniel was gone. Oh my God, that's so funny. I never, ever thought about this, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I it, love Courtney so much. Court, she and I are, we give each other so much shit. Like, it's the best. Like, I troll her on Instagram all the time. And like, it's just, it's, I, and she's hilarious. But that is so funny. I could, oh my God, I love it. Can you guys tell, have you floated this to, to the guys, to the writers? Oh no, we they're they're not it. legally allowed to read fan fiction. Thank God, because that means I never read mine. <laughs> but oh um, my God, I love it. Wait, so how far do she and I get? How far do you? How far does your imagination go? I mean, it's it's fan fiction. I if, know, but is there like steamy sex scenes? Yes. Shut up. No, ah, I'm serious. Ah. I'm serious. There's a, like sweet romantic relationship up. moments, and then there's hot, steamy sex scenes. And if yeah. you're watching this, Courtney, you're welcome. <laughs> this is the moment in your career you've been waiting for. Oh, this may be the <laughs> nail in the coffin that keeps Courtney from ever coming on this podcast. <laughs> Come on, Courtney. <sighs> Settle it once and for all. That is so funny. And, and oh. if it's any consolation, most of it is actually very, very well written. Really? Yeah, some <laughs> super, super me, smart fans who ship you. You gotta to. send me some of this. Nothing, uh, no, nothing would turn me on more than my own fan fiction. <laughs> Do we know it? Do we know it? Um, there, there's a couple scenes from the, the season one that, uh, if you can shed some insight on uh, the, the the point where you guys are. What's the song? Oh, do you like a bubble tea? Say hello to Supervisor Seth. Um, oh, God. You know, <laughs> I'm like, who is that? Or Tom Cole. What? Well, he, he knows who I'm interviewing, so he threw a Tom Cole joke, what's the saw. Anyway, okay. the um, where you guys are doing the billboard, is was that a set? Were you guys uh, on, like, a shorter billboard outside? Like, what was the yeah, staging of that? They actually built uh, in the parking lot of the like where all the writers and the production staff are, they built an actual billboard. So it was in this random parking lot and it was a full fucking billboard. Like it wasn't shorter, they had a ladder and everything. Um, it was awesome, it was so cool. I'm, I'm surprised there was no like behind the scenes of that, you know, any pictures, but speaking with Hayden and very often, he doesn't like certain pictures to be released out there because um, certain pictures kind of give away the magic, you know, and, and he wants to retain that. So there's yeah, like especially, some... you know, that was the first season and no one knew anything about LaRusso Auto or it's not. And suddenly there's this huge billboard that says LaRusso Auto with a huge dick on it in this <laughs> random parking lot. And they told us like no pictures of this can go out. But also like, but it was also like people were driving by and they were probably like LaRusso Auto, what the hell is that? I'm I'm just trying to imagine because you know we 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 know that general area and those roads it's a, you know it's a residential area small roads stuff yeah people driving by with this giant billboard of Ralph Macchio with a dick in right. his mouth yeah um I wonder what the I wonder what the people that lived around there thought was going on <laughs> they were like the neighborhood is going to hell <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping they would have written that Ralph Macchio <laughs> um. So in season so three, funny, you tell me season one and it brings me back because it was like, you know, it was such a weird thing to be on a show that was on YouTube because it was, it is such an amazing show. In fact, it's, you know, it's enthralled literally the whole world. Mm -hmm. Like I'm getting fan mail on Instagram from like, like DMs from like people in Pakistan, like, going like you are the best Anush. So like, <laughs> it's just like, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And to know that it was on when it was on YouTube and no one was watching it or not that many people were watching it, it was so frustrating for us because we would tell everyone like, guys, there's this show 
you have to watch it. It's like an unbelievable show. And they'd be like, great, what, what's it on? And they'd be like, YouTube Premium. And they'd be like, fuck that. I'm not going on YouTube. So it was like so frustrating and then so gratifying when it finally got to Netflix, when it was like, okay, now you guys have to watch it. So, you know, but you know, you guys were fans from the beginning. So, you know, it was like, there was this gem that no one was paying attention to. And it was so crazy. Criminally yeah. underseen, Peter always used to say that was that was like a, t a tagline. It, yeah. it we because I mean we're of course not as invested in it being not in it, but from the outside looking in, it was ridiculously frustrating. I have friends and family members, huge Karate Kid fans. Oh my God, you got to watch the show, um, and they're the, the same thing. Where is it? And you, oh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not paying for it. And I'm like, you can get it for free for 30 days. Watch the show. Cancel. It's not that hard. I'm not. I'm not putting that much effort into it. Oh my God, I literally should have made a business card that said that on it because you don't know how many people I said that to. You can get it for free for 30 days and then just cancel. <laughs> right. And then use a different email or you know use use a different email address for season two and. Um, it just goes to show like there's such a. You know, we're so used to getting whatever we want, whenever we want content wise now that if you put up even a tiny barrier, like no one's going to do it. That's actually very true. Mm -hmm. I wonder where you guys would be right now if Netflix had matched YouTube's offer right off the very beginning. I think you'd probably be bigger than you are and you're already pretty stinking big. I don't know if that's true, though. I'll tell you why, because I think that the what happened was you had the pandemic hit, right? Mm -hmm. And Netflix, which I'm actually going to be on a new Netflix show starting next month, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. But Netflix basically like tripled the amount of subscribers they had because of the pandemic, because everyone was locked inside. And then there was like this sweet spot of Cobra Kai came out on Netflix at a time when people were starting to say, man, I've run out of stuff to watch. Do you know like a good show? Are there any new shows? I watched all the shows. Are there any new shows? And that's when Cobra Kai came out. And I think that that's why it became, like it was so much fuel to the fire that I don't think you would have had nearly the, the uh, you know, uh, what is it called? The, the what are those? The balls? reception? The snowball. The snowball oh, effect yeah. uh, that you had with, you know, pandemic and, and, and people running out of things to watch and everyone getting Netflix. Netflix, Netflix took on, I think they added more subscribers since the pandemic than they did in their whole history of Netflix. So what I'm saying is, thank God for COVID, guys. <laughs> you don't hear that very much. <laughs> no. Please don't I, take that out of context. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I mean, you, you, you do make a very good point because without the jump from YouTube to Netflix and without that extra 12 month delay, um, it just would have dropped in April like it always did and it wouldn't have been like then there would have been the big blank spot as we wait for Atlanta to get safe enough for you guys to go back in January right. and then we have the big delay for season four. Um, so yeah, and also, it yeah, it was just so wonderfully bingeable where you had a whole season and then two months later you got another season and then what was it like? Uh, another season, you know, it's like everything well, came out so quickly. One and two came out together. Yeah, one and two came out. That's right. So it was so wonderfully bingeable. Um, and it was just, it, it, it worked out really well. The funny thing was listening to all the people that found it and discovered it. And oh my God, it's amazing in August. Yeah. Griping about how long they had to wait for season three. And it's like, now wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, we'll get in line. Right. We've been following the band when they were playing out of a garage. Yes. You're like, you're listening to them now that they're on every radio station. And I mean, that's a, it feels like that though, right? Like right. It's, it, yeah. Like, um, we were an indie, little indie band. What's, what's the movie The they don't know what it means to be a fan, to understand every word, to appreciate. What movie is that? Um, oh, it's about the, the, the girl that followed the band around. She was a groupie from the time they were like, it's a big oh, movie. Almost famous. Yes. Almost famous. Yeah. Yeah. And she gives this big speech when they get big about how the new fans don't count yeah. because yeah. they don't I, understand them. I mean, I'm not going to say that. I love the new fans. Right? I love you guys. <laughs> Can I say I love you guys more? Aww. But I, I love everyone. But um, but yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't. Want, I, I will say this though: the one negative thing about being on this show uh, that became so hugely famous during a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, Netflix just put out the numbers. 
I think it was uh, seasons one, two, and three have, have now been in 75 million households mm -hmm. around the world. The one negative thing is that every time I leave the house, I have to wear a fucking mask. And no one recognizes me from the show. <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life to be on a show like this so I can go out and get recognized. And now I have to wear a mask whenever I'm outside. It's criminal. You're not getting harassed for autographs at restaurants. You're not oh. getting stopped on the street for photos. No, I have to lock myself in my fucking house. Is all I have to do <laughs> during my most famous moment. It's funny though, I go on a hike every day and I was on my hike last week. And I'm, I, you know, I'm wearing my I'm masked up and this uh, mom and these two kids are walking by and the boy who's probably like nine is wearing a, a, a medical mask that has the Cobra Kai, has a Cobra Kai mask on his face. And I stopped, I was like, hey, do you watch Cobra Kai? He's like, yeah, I love Cobra Kai. I was like, I'm a noosh. And I like pulled my mask down and he like froze, like he <laughs> didn't know what to do. <laughs> it was so funny. And it was so great because it was like the first time I could be recognized as a new. And it was by a nine-year-old. Well, yeah. I've, I've seen ads where you can actually get your face printed on that bottom half. So you could be wearing a mask and still look like you. I mean, I want to get a, yeah. My brother wants to get me one of those as a joke. I think I'm just going to get a mask that says, hey, I'm in Cobra Kai. Uh, ask, me, <laughs> ask me for an autograph. <laughs> Ask me for a selfie. Okay, so getting back to the show for a second. <laughs> yeah. um, season two, after Anoush left, we were all in mourning. We were all very scared. Um, did you know at that time that you were coming back? Um, I did not know for sure that I was coming back. I knew out of like jokes that that the guys were making, like, oh, you're never going to come back, man. You know, so I kind of figured that I was going to come back. Right. Um, but I did know for a while that I was, you know, once I shot it and stuff, but they were like, you got to keep this a secret. So I couldn't tell anyone. And people were like going nuts. Like, is Anoush coming back? What's going on? And I would always respond to people as Anoush, like in character. So like my cousin, my cousin just, she's been binging like this week and she just texted me. She was like, oh my God, do you come back in season three? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, the way Danny, he treated me so badly. I don't know if, if I want to come back. He's like, no, she's like, no, but seriously, like, are you, are you going to be free? I was like, I don't know. I have a lot to think about. He didn't get my back. I got my ass kicked in the, in, in the uh, you know, on the dealership floor. She's like, oh my God, you're so annoying. Are you going to be in it? I was like, you know what? You are not showing any empathy. I can't with you. <laughs> so did Anoush finally get his surf and turf at Delmonico's or was it just a bottle of wine? Uh, I didn't get, he didn't get anything really. It just the fact that Daniel knew his name. Although I, but the guys took me out to a wonderful surf and turf dinner in Atlanta and paid for it. So I did get one in real life. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, of the three seasons, do you recall any, uh, lines that you just loved or, uh, takes, um, things like that, that didn't make it into the final cut? I didn't make it into the final cut. Um, Oof, I can't remember right now, but that line about, what's the line? You guys probably know better than I do. But the Ox Oxfords? The shoes? or No, it was about the uh, the uh, uh, porn star. No, what was it about? Like, oh, the Vixen? The, the Vixen uh, yeah, line. we're only five minutes from Vixen video. She only has to drive. And they, yeah. Yeah, but it was something. Oh, girls with daddy issues are the worst. Worst and the best. Yeah. <laughs> I love that line. I, I uh, love the, the interplay between Louis and Anoush. Just, I mean, you and Brett and your timing off of each other and Tanner just standing there as the straight man gaping at both of you like, what the hell are you talking about? It just, <laughs> the popcorn scene is like one of my favorite scenes of season one. And it's so simple and it's so silly, but it's just so Louis and Anoush. And so fun. It's poor so Robbie, fun. just like, what is going on? It's so fun. I'll tell you about what my worst moment on Cobra Kai was, which is, so I have this thing that whenever I act, whenever I do a show, it doesn't matter if it's like day one, day two, day three, day four, my first take and my second take are garbage. I always just like garble up the words. It's just the way, it's just what happens. My first day on Cobra Kai though, and like my first line is basically in the scene where Johnny and Danny are meeting for the first time ever, mm -hmm. okay? So talk about ratcheting, ratcheting up the pressure. 
everyone is in the room. Everyone's, it's electric because these two guys are meeting for the first time. And I start to like mess up my line. And it was like, oh my God, I'm going to get fired from this show. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I even went up to the guys. I was like, guys, just so you know, my first two takes are throwaways. I'm so sorry, but like, it's just, it's just the way that I am. And it was just like the most nerve wracking thing because of, of course, of course, like, you know, uh, Johnny and Danny know their lines perfectly, you know, Ralph and Billy know, know their lines perfectly. And I'm just like, Oh, I know my lines guys. It's just this thing. It's a, it's like a kink that I have, but it was like, it was the most nerve wracking uh, moment on a set I've ever had. Was it the bonsai line where your uh, Mr. LaRusso would like to thank you personally, or was it the no fighting in the showroom guys? That was one of them. I messed that one a bunch. <laughs> oh God. And Mr. LaRusso would like to thank you personally. Oh, wait, hold on. Can I say that again? <laughs> and Mr. LaRusso would, God. <laughs> and Mr. LaRusso would like to thank you personally with his own person. Ah! And I'm like, and they're like, and you know, Billy and, and, the uh, and, God, I keep messing up the names. Uh, Billy and Ralph are like watching this too. From And so I'm like, they're watching this. And it was just like the worst. And then I think I messed up the line when they meet too. Like, uh, oh, was this the karate guy? Yeah. And then the no fighting and no, no fighting in the showroom and push by, apart. Well, by the time I got to no fighting in the showroom, I was good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, no fighting in the showroom, guys. I like that line. Yeah, um, I, I love all of I love all of Louis's lines. Um, I love everything about Louis except the time he got up out of his chair and walked away. That was so sad and it broke my heart. Wait, Anoush, you mean? Anoush, yes, I said Louis didn't okay. die. I, I apologize. Like, I, I hate I, Louis. I'm like, now is the time to praise Louis. I no, praise, I like, hate Louis. I hate I like, Louis. You're, you're lying because we all know that you hate Louis. Fucking <laughs> Louis, Louis man! Don't get me started on fucking Louis, man. Oh, do you, you hate Louis? Louis? Tell me oh, why. I hate Louis. <laughs> Um, I hate Louis because he throws Daniel under the bus. Yes. Um, and because he burns Johnny's car down. Yes. Oh, I love this. This is music to my ears. And because he brings the bikers in after Daniel tells him not to. And he goes around name dropping Daniel every chance he gets, which at some point is going to get Daniel in a whole lot of trouble. So he yeah. really needs to stop doing that. And he's not as handsome as a noosh. Yep. <laughs> Well, I I, I, uh, I I compare everybody to Daniel. Oh, we're all gonna lose that game. <laughs> yeah. Huge fan over there. Yeah, um, yeah big Daniel fan. Uh, you you mentioned you, you, you uh, OnlyFans. He has an OnlyFans. He does also. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, great. That uh, seems much more a Billy thing. The shirtless. Yeah. You know. After season three. Right. Uh, in season one. Um, Anoush and Louis, they do some hazing with with uh, with Robbie. Did you guys do anything with Tanner, like uh, behind cameras or anything like that, just to mess with them? No, everyone is so nice. I mean, and, and the funny thing is, like, a bunch of them are uh, are Falafel Phil fans. So the first time we all met, like, they were like, "Oh my God, Falafel Phil!" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, guys, please let's leave Falafel Phil out of this show. <laughs> Well, does that put you in with um, Peyton and um, Jacob in the, the Disney kids that have made the jump to Cobra Kai? That, you're definitely one of the Disney kids, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess I am one of the Disney kids. Yeah. yeah. OG Disney kid. Yeah, I'm one of the OGs. <laughs> My daughter-in-law uh, told me to ask you, was the snake in the dealership real? Yes. They brought in a snake handler. Which I was like, uh, can't we do this in post? Why the fuck is there a snake here? <laughs> but yeah, there was absolutely a snake and it was not playing. It was not, you know, it wasn't a team player, the snake. The snake took a lot of wrangling to get to go in the right direction and stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I just have to congratulate you on that scene because the first time any of us saw it, they dropped it, zero context, in the middle of the Christmas um, metal music live stream which I, I had running while we were opening presents Christmas morning. And then all of a sudden, my daughter-in-law is like, it's a noosh. And I turn around and I'm like, what is going on on my TV right now? And in that context, that scene was ridiculous, cheesy, ham-fisted, over the top. I'm like, what on earth is, is happening with this show? And then in context, in the episode, 
that scene is scary as hell. Yeah. So yeah. it's funny that they released that scene because there was so much, I was being told so much, like, do not tell anyone that you're going to be in it. And then they showed that. And then I start getting my, my phone is lighting up. Like you're in, you're in the next season. You're in the next season. I'm like, what happened? And I saw on Twitter that they released this video and I was like, I, I, I reached out to Josh Heald. I was like, dude, there's a video of me. He's like, yeah, just don't retweet it. Don't, don't give it any, any oxygen. Hopefully not enough people see it. So, uh, Oh, unfortunately yeah. I saw it. And the first thing I did was run to Twitter and oh my God, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was everywhere, you know, like, yeah. and I know that the guys, they hate things like that, that, that come out and, Clearly, it wasn't a leak. It was just something that that, that came out. And somebody thought it was a good yeah, idea. Netflix but, has a huge like promotional department, and like for everyone to talk together is probably like just crazy. So, eh, it was a little leak, but it wasn't that big of a deal. A lot of people were happy. Like, great, Anush is back. Oh yeah. Well, not not only was he back, but like it, many people were like, well, he goes back to Larusso. Clearly, you know. So at that point, you Anush uh, did not yet, oh, yeah. but. You know the perception was like, oh, he goes back to Larusso, so so that was kind of already spoiled. Yeah, um, I mean, what? Yeah, I'm curious what's gonna happen in season four. You guys seem to have better predictions than anyone else. Oh, we do. We, we well, we I spend don't. hours and hours dissecting you know the show and stuff. Um, I know that Michael Jonathan Smith checked out our uh, season three reaction. He, I don't think he commented on it, but we we like to feel that um, you know that we have like a pulse on the show. I mean we. We covered on this podcast, and we've spoken with many people, and we interact with the guys on on Twitter. And no, you guys go deep. Stuff. I was like, this, this, these questions are great. I would never hear these on any other. Usually, it's like, what's it like working with Ralph Macchio? I'm like, he's great. He's great. They're like, great. Thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, no. That, that, you guys are like, it. what size suit were you wearing in season one? <laughs> As com- actually, this is a very funny story. So um, the I come back for season two. And uh, no, was it season two? Yes, I come back for season two and I'm putting on my wardrobe and there's an amazing wardrobe guy. And he, uh, what's that? Frank? Yes, Frank. So Uh, Frank, Frank have you guys guys, uh, interviewed him? Yeah. He's amazing. I love him so much. So Frank is like, I'm putting my my suit on, which is, uh, you know, and it's super tight on me. And I'm like, Frank, is this the same suit from season one? He's like, yeah. I'm like, why is it so tight on me? He's like, oh, they had, you know, in the room that they were storing them in, there was like a humidity issue and like a lot of the clothes shrank. I was like, oh God, thank God. He's like, no, I'm just kidding. You got fat. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, you cracked me up so much. So they literally had to open up the suit like two inches because I got fat. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, fr- Frank's awesome. I actually commissioned him to make me a lotus headband into a mask. So, oh, so cool. I got that from him. Yeah. Um, as we get ready to wrap up, you kind of teased uh, something coming out that you wanted to pimp uh, a new show uh, next month. Yeah, actually, the trailer just came out yesterday. Uh, I'm going to be on Kevin James's new sitcom on Netflix called The Crew, and it's a NASCAR based uh, sitcom. And it's super duper funny. I'm very happy with how it came out. I play a very different character from Anoush. Um, and uh, it is coming out on February 15th on Netflix. So come for the Cobra Kai, stay for the crew. Oh, I'm oh definitely, God. Kevin James, definitely going to have to figure that out or watch that. Uh, what was I going to say? Not figure check that out. out. That doesn't make it. Out. Check it out. There we go. Yeah, yeah check it out. Figure out the show. <laughs> I got to figure out the show. <laughs> then you can watch the show. But my husband yeah. is, a, is a huge Kevin James fan. So. Oh, you guys will love it. It's, it's, yeah. I'm so happy with how it came out. And I think it's really going to be great. Oh, uh, that's awesome. The so, trailer's on Netflix now. You can watch the trailer. Um, I know you can't talk anything about this season four or if you've left or if you are leaving or any of that. So we won't get into that. Um, I mean, we could ask you and then you could tell us and shoot us and whatever. But the truth is I know nothing. So you can ask whatever you want. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is, by the way, exactly what I would say, even if I knew something. Exactly. (laughs) Mm, Doing the Dr. Evil thing. I see that. (laughs) For the listeners at home. So is there anything else, um, anything that you're writing, any stand-up shows that you have scheduled? Well, yeah, me and uh, me and Brett might start start going out and doing some stand-up shows. Uh, we'll let you guys know about that soon. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, I mean, for now, just waiting for the crew to come out and uh, waiting to see what happens with Cobra Kai. Yeah. Uh, up, uh, ever onward and upward and bigger and I don't know how much bigger you could get, but. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm just hoping that everyone gets vaccinated so that I can finally get recognized. Oh my God. I'm, I'm, I'm I, 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 and, and just for the, the sake of filming, I'm trying to figure out just exactly how you do a karate fight show when you're not allowed to touch each other. I mean that. Well, I'll tell you something. The the Kevin James show, we had filmed seven episodes pre quarantine, pre COVID, and then we COVID hit, and we basically had to go back and shoot the next three episodes to finish out the season. And we were the first Netflix show back in production in the U.S. Um, and a lot of people were watching how we were doing it because you know no one else was doing productions, and it was really intense. We were all quarantining at the same hotel. Uh, together, we were all getting uh, test. We were getting tested five times a week. Uh, wow! Non-stop nasal swabbing through my nose. My nose uh, was never really big. I had a cute little button nose, and now look at what all the COVID <laughs> testing has done to it. Because they have uh, Q-tips. Yeah, uh, and, and it was wild. Yeah, it was. There was a lot of weird rules. Like you can't pass. You can't pass a prop from one actor to the other, and you have to wear your mask all the time until basically they're shooting the final shot. So it's super weird, but I'm so glad that, you know, they're figuring out a way. And yeah, it was the charge. They're 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 the leaders of this. That was scary for a while and and live theater Broadway the lights are still off. They haven't figured out how to do live theater yet and that's that to me I was an acting major, I was a theater major. I was a stage performer. So Broadway's lights being off just like rips my heart out of my chest. I mean, I get it. And it's really awful because if you think about like sports and stuff, they can do without a crowd because they can play with this cameras and, you know, make it look like there's a crowd and stuff. Like I was just watching a football game and there were like a thousand people in the stadium versus like 30,000. And mm -hmm. it's like, and they can get away with it. But Broadway, like they need to fill all those seats to like br basically break even on the rent. Mm -hmm. So... To, for them to not be able to do that. And it's just not the same to watch live theater on Zoom or like, you know, like a, you know, a recorded version of it. The whole magic of it is being there. Um, you know, I've been doing some stand-up shows since, you know, since COVID. And it's just like, it's not the same. It's just, you, you miss the magic. So, I mean, it's a bummer and I really hope that they can survive it. Yeah, me too. Do you because we've got a Karate Kid musical we're waiting for. Do you usually end these podcasts on a super depressing note? Um, <laughs> only when I'm the last one talking. I, I tend to be the bummer. Sorry. Real uh, life, right, get so... out of here. We're talking Cobra Kai. We live in the same <laughs> yeah, universe yeah. with Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence and Anush Naruzi, who yeah. we adore. I love the fact that you guys know the last name. That's so funny. It's on your door. It was, yeah, there's that, but it's also one of our trivia questions when we do the All Valley Trivia Championship. It was a trivia oh, question. That it was, yeah. <laughs> And it took out like 70% of the people that were still playing when they got to that question. Oh, I love it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So Dan, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, you're super busy and all that. And thank you for squeezing us in. Uh, that, that's that's all, that's all we got for you. So Brianna, if you got no other questions, uh, I think we're done. Thank you. Love you. Thank Come you back. so much guys. I really appreciate it. It was so, so fun being on this and talking to two super fans and, uh, uh, everyone listening, please follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Stand Up Dan and listen to my food podcast, Green Eggs and Dan. You might want to start with uh, either the Josh Heald episode or the Brett Ernst episode. And if you listen to the episode with me and Brett, you will realize that we are exactly the same uh, in real life as we are as 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 we are on on Cobra Kai as uh, Anush and Louie. And links to all of Dan's socials and his podcast are in the description. And so our links to Peter, everywhere he is, everywhere the podcast is, and myself, everywhere I am. Which is everywhere. We're pretty well everywhere. <laughs>